Humans have explored nearly every biome on Earth, but when it comes to getting around in the ocean, we are clearly outmatched. Fish are built to ride waves and currents with ease. To effectively navigate the water, we need to mimic fish by wearing fins. One sea slug looked up from the reef to see some tasty resources and did something very similar. Sometimes there's more than one way to get past a problem, but other challenges require a single solution in life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter at LD Taxonomy or visit us at our home on the web at LDTaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons, to Tristan Taylor, Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, and Paul, uh, Richard Kaspar. Uh, I want to be like more genuine. I feel like I'm, yeah, I am just like reciting something that I've memorized. But we really do appreciate our uh, our, our patrons. Uh, they allow us to like buy more space for our well, storage space for our, our these massive like video files that we're working with. Um, they allow us to to buy the hosting um, subscription and um, get like a nice microphone and a nice camera like the like not super nice but like the, the these things allow us to to deliver better content to you guys so thank you so much to the people who have contributed who are contributing if you'd like to uh contribute um it it's uh patreon.com slash ld taxonomy and you can subscribe and if you become a patron you get to listen to us talk about just just you know, shoot the breeze uh, for about 30 minutes before every episode um, as we like kind of warm up our conversational muscles because, you know, we, we work from home. We sit all day not talking to people. So you got to you gotta warm it up before you start the podcast. Um, so if you'd like to hear us talk about Christmassy things and our favorite Christmas songs and flat earthers, <laughs> you can uh, you can uh, subscribe on Patreon and 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 uh, you'll get access to all of that. But anyway. I, I wanted this this holiday special, this Star Wars holiday special, to um to not be just my my rope. Like, thanks, Rob. Let us keep the lights on. And, you know, I, I know it seems rope, but I, we really do appreciate it. Thank you. And today we're talking about an imposter that's not among us, but among the fish of the sea. But that, more on that later. A I've tiny never, among us. I've never played among us. Oh, no, I don't have fun. enough friends. Mason doesn't want to play with me. Well, that's rude of him. I give I hand him a phone, and he just he get he locks Eats me it. out of it for for five minutes. <laughs> that's all. He, that's all. He, uh, all he does. But we, this yeah. is this is coming out in the intertestamental period, right? In between <laughs> intertestamental, with the Old Testament in between being Christmas, Christmas, New Testament being New Year's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The old years and the New Years. Um, yeah, this is the Maccabean period. Yeah, everyone. Um, uh, Get to the gym, um, go for a walk, have those digestive uh, juices flowing while you are in between big holiday meals. That, that uh, that's my advice to you. No, there's, a lot, of, there's this, a lot of calories. This is the this is this is where you eat. You're like, okay, I'm gonna start working out January first, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. eat the cookies now. The cookies are here, no, no, no. and I'm gonna eat them now. I mean, eat your holiday cookies, but also like go for a walk, burn some calories, make some room. True, true. My, I've, it feels I've got, better to earn those calories, you know. Yeah, I've got a lot of New Year's resolutions, and one of them is definitely to get back to exercising because I've not really done that for the last few months because of how busy things have been. Um, so I am excited to get back into that, even though. Uh, I hate working out. I'm just excited to not feel gross all the time and to sleep better. Um, but anyway, we're talking about the Philly Row. 
Yeah. Yep. The bet you know exactly what that is, listening listeners at home. Just by it's hearing eggs it. with cheese melted in it on a on a bun. Isn't that's what isn't roe fish eggs in Philly like a Philly cheesesteak? No idea. I thought a <laughs> Philly was a horse. That too. And it's a flyer. Is it a flyer? It's a kind of flyer. Philadelphia Flyers. Oh. (laughs) Never mind. Is that their hockey team or something? Yes. Nice guess. Oh, nice. Well, because I know that they're the Eagles for football and the White White Sox for baseball. No, that's their Chicago. Uh, I don't know what their baseball team is. And I don't know where the best. I don't. I, that was a good guess. Phillies. I'll take the, the guess. The Phillies. They're just Phillies. That's so yeah. boring. That's like the Tennessee Volunteers. That's where the Philly fanatic comes from, though. He's like the Green Monster. I, yeah, I don't know that one either. They're like they're rabid baseball fans there. I imagine they're they known are. for being uh, particularly fanatic, actually. Yeah, but nothing like New England though. Oh, that that that, that made them froth. If you if they heard you say that, I mean, they froth at the mouth. They're, but like, they're, re- New England is renowned for having insane fans. I think like, so is Philly, Philadelphia, the Phillies. But um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, sports guys. It's th- th- this animal is called the Philly Road, and we will explain what it is. In several stages <laughs> throughout the show, um, but we're going to call it the Phillyville Slugger. <laughs> nice. You <laughs> didn't even know about the Phillies baseball team, and you came up with that. Well, I was trying to find something for Louisville Slugger, um, and I couldn't find a good like thing, so I just put Phillyville, Philly, Phillyville Slugger, and I did wow. not know about the baseball thing. Um, we're going to call it the the crude, rude, nudie branch. <laughs> um. I guess the crude, rude, nudie branch, dude, that would, that would, that would work. Um, and what I'm going to call it, Phyllis. Phyllis? Phyllis. Philly Row Phyllis. It's a, yeah, there is a, it's close to that, Phyllis. I was going to say something like uh, Philly Row versus Spade or something like that, but uh, <laughs> it, it didn't work as well as I had hoped. So we're, we're, these are the nicknames that we've got. And so it's time to taxonomize this uh this is in a kingdom you know love and are in that kingdom is animalia i don't think we're ever planning on deviating from that so that's that's a good assumption to make uh the phylum is mollusca it's a mollusk the class is gastropoda we've been here it's snails and slugs uh, the order is Nudibranchia or Bronchia. Probably Branchia. No, no, it's probably Bronchia, like bronchitis. Um, the C H I doesn't make it a doesn't make it a hard C H. Um, so it's a nudie branch. Uh, the phylum is Philoroidae. and the genus is Philoro, and the species is Bucephalum. So, Philirobucephalum is the binomial hmm. nomenclature for this odd-looking boy. But that, since we're in the business of naming things, brings us to my favorite part of the show, Critter Groups. The part of the show where I ask you, Joe, a question, and that question is the same every time. What is the name of a group of this animal, or what is the term of entry, or what is the collective noun? It's three ways to say the same thing, or ask the same question. If you saw a group of slugs, what would you call it? Would you call it A, a phlegm of slugs? B, a clod of slugs? C, a spit of slugs? Or D, a hairy of slugs? Hairy? Spelled how? H-A-R-R-Y. Hmm. Hmm. Spit of slugs? That's fun. Let's do that. Final answer. 
Eh. Dang. Which one was it? It's phlegm. See, so my gut was telling me, one, it was either spit and it made you think of phlegm, or it was phlegm and it made you think of spit. <laughs> trying to follow 50, 50. my train of thought. Um, <laughs> so it's like you you, you, you uh, take all four options and you see like which one of these two things are the most related, and then it's probably between one of those two. <laughs> yeah, that would be in that case. I had to look now at Claude just, to make sure it wasn't some sort of um, like really bad slur, but it just means a dumb no, person. That's a person's name. Claude? Oh, yeah, Cloud. Claude. Oh, I put C L O D, like a like like <laughs> the way the British would a British person would call a dumb person. Yeah, that insensitive Claude. Um, but yeah, I forgot that Claude is a person's name. Ah. <laughs> uh, Jean Claude. Um, he's one of the he's one of the French bees. So yeah, it's a phlegm of uh, slugs. We have, I think the we we've done one other slug, which was the, um, the Elysian, uh, green slug. Uh huh. And um, so this is this this is the only the second slug that we have done in this show. Only two the whole show apparently we don't think slugs are all that interesting till today but they, but they certainly are uh would you like to hear about what this thing looks like i sure would all right buckle up buttercup because this one's a weird one <laughs> this is it is unlike you joe to to pick a uh a deep sea weirdo that is usually that is that is my domain. This is the domain of me. It's just <laughs> You're the me. The Poseidon of this podcast. It's me and James Cameron. This is the two of us down there. I'm thinking about it, and he's actually going there. That's I'm there in spirit. Um, because if goodness gracious, you can't get me to go down there in in physical. <laughs> that's that's too scary. Um, but okay, so this uh, this animal, <laughs> the Philly row. Uh, looks like an enchanted doodle of a squid fish that has that has come to life. Um, it is like if the Elden Beast and the Spirit of the Forest from Princess Mononoke had a guppy together. Um, it is it's oblong, so it's kind of, it's kind of has this cell oblong sh shape, this amorphous looking thing. Um, its body is completely clear. Uh, it's and it's speckled with these little white flecks of of light by luminescent light. You can see it's semi clear and also luminescent organs uh, that are that line its body, uh, as well as the its um, uh, I believe it's its circulatory system it spreads throughout its body. And it's red, and uh, look if you look at pictures of this guy, it looks like there's just this tarantula this four-legged tarantula living inside this this thing's body um it's it got these four like spindle legs that that go out in like an x pattern um with like the bulbous um organs in the middle so it looks like if there's a big spider or like the spidey symbol on spider-man's back um it also has two large uh antenna uh, which aren't actually antenna. They're they are called rhinophores or long horns, uh, even though they're not technically horns. Um, they are they they look like just the most spectacular slug mustache, slug stash, um, and uh, it it's it's pretty impressive. It's it's vintage man mustache levels. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure if I effectively described this thing. I don't really have much more, <laughs> more to say about it, outside of just describing its individual organs. But it, if if you've ever seen like an electron microscope view of like a, a cell, and um, or not an electron microscope, just normal microscope view of a cell, um, it it, it kind of looks like that, but very bright and shiny, and with a giant spider living inside. So mm -hmm. I'm sure this I've 
you, you're imagining the correct thing right now. Um, other than that, there's nothing interesting about it, and it's not in, in any sort of interesting shapes whatsoever. Interesting, it is. Um, would you like to know about its size and dimensions? Yeah, I mean, it lives in the deep sea, so it could either be, um, you know, the 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 size of a grain of rice, um, or it could be the size of a continent, and that's. It could be a part of that gigantism thing that I'm so scared of. So, yeah. tell us how There's big this guy is. There's nothing the size is. of a continent. Except a continent. Yeah. And one of, one of those lion turtles from Avatar. Um, welcome to the Love Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show. The part of the show when we, when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also part of the show that's introduced by you when you send in audio yourself saying, singing, or chittering. The words measure up into ldtaxonomy at gmail.com. But by uh, the last many episodes track record, it is not the um, part of the show that's introduced by you. Rather, it is the part of the show that's introduced by some sort of animal. And we don't we have any measure a, up intro this week. We didn't get a Christmas, a Christmas miracle. We didn't get a Christmas miracle. No. I, okay. Yeah. So yeah, we don't have a new measure of interest, so we get to hear from an animal, and Carlos has to guess what it is. Uh, without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. Is that a I feel, I feel under attack is that a a lion b a mountain lion c a sea lion or d a lion fish which you could argue is also another kind of sea lion yeah i'm gonna have to go with sea lion there c c for sea lion c c is c for and c and c is for sea lion and cookie is for me and cookie is for Catwoman. Um, <laughs> see, cookie is for Catwoman. Final answer. This is a sparrow with a machine gun. Yes. That's the correct answer. I knew it. I knew that was qu that was very quintessential sea lion sound. I think it would have been more it would have been harder if paired with like bovids. Uh but I couldn't resist the lion theme. Yeah, I've heard lions. They do make weird sounds, but I've never heard them make any of those sounds. We got lions at the Jacksonville Zoo, and when they roar, you can hear them anywhere in the zoo, which is cool. But it's true. And I've also I, I spent some to... time around sea lions in South Africa, and I have heard them make that exact sound. So, and they also smell to in, high uh, heaven. I knew somebody in college that lived within a few miles of a lion country safari. And she could oh, hear yeah. lions all the time. Yeah, you can. I've we I, the one time I went to Lion Country Safari, we camped out there, and you can hear the lions roaring all night. That's cool. It is cool. And scary. Okay, let's talk uh, length. They're between two point two inches. Oh wait, before oh. we get into the length, uh, we got um, a suggestion, an animal suggestion. Okay. F from Calvin, from Calvin himself. They've gotten a, a, a dog. Ooh. And uh, they named him Maverick. That's a good name and for a dog. It's uh, the, the dog's name is is not named after uh, Tom Cruise. The late, the late, uh, the late senator John McCain, aka Maverick. Instead, it is named after the pilot from Top Gun. Top He's Calvin Gun. loves planes. But uh, he asked if we could do dogs, just uh, Canis familiaris, and uh, I put it on the list. We're not doing it this week or next week or the week after, but it's on the list and it's coming. I'm not a, a witch. I don't have a dog familiar. I don't have a Canis familiaris. Canis familiaris. Some interesting facts about th that. You would you? Well, they also like we know about them a lot, you know, because we hang out. We, as humans, we uh, we're friends with uh, with dogs, so we know a little thing or two about them. 
Yeah. Maybe I'll bring my dog. No, it's a bad idea. As a special guest? <laughs> that is a bad idea. <laughs> no, Morph, Morph would be fine. Maybe he can sit in my lap while we podcast. And they were just... special guests in the first episode. Yeah, Yoshi barked a lot in our first episode, and yet people continue to go back there and uh, and listen to it, <laughs> and not our newer, <laughs> better stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, okay, let's really talk length. They're they're two point two inches uh, or five point five centimeters. So here's a Jeopardy style question for you, and the second one will be a traditional uh, math related question. So this body of water is forty eight thousand nine hundred and sixty filly row across at its widest point. What is the body of water? Here's a hint. What it's it's. It's widest at the city of Edf- Edfu. And the river is also 26 to 36 feet deep on average. So it's a river. It's a river. Near the city of Edu? Edfu. Edfu. E-D-F-U. Hmm. <laughs> Eat food every day. Uh, I don't know what kind of what I, I was hoping Excellent that maybe the name for you, <laughs> but the the U is just the U. Um, I was hoping that maybe the name of the city would give me an inkling into what country this was in. Yeah, it does. It do, it could go a lot of ways. That yeah, I, I mean, it could it could be Brazilian city. It could be a Vietnamese city like I, <laughs> I don't know Edfu I know that like what f- pho that's that like Thai soup or something like that um, not that that helps at all <laughs> I don't know um, Edfu. It's, what, it's one point something one point one and a half wide maybe. river, so miles wide. Wide river. I know the Amazon River gets really wide. I know the Yangtze River gets really wide. The Nile probably gets pretty wide. Also, Edfu could be any number of um, East African countries. Um, it could be. Uh, it could be a Chinese country too. It could be. It doesn't really sound Chinese to me. It sounds least South American, but it could be still. It could be like um, a a city named after, like a a a local indigenous population in 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 Brazil or something like that. True. Um, I'm going to go with Nile. That's Nile River. That's that's my final answer. That's all I've got. Final answer. <laughs> Just really well. shooting in the dark here. Yes. It's, at least I know it's a river because there's that narrowed it down quite a bit. But Nile. That is correct. Oh. The Nile River is 1.7 miles <laughs> wide at its widest. If you hadn't told me it was a river, though, I would have 100 percent gotten it wrong. I would have said something. You like, you could have extrapolated that it was a wit- uh, river when I said it's what. Uh, it's widest at a particular place no, in a particular l- city. Lakes can be wide at a certain at a particular place and then narrower somewhere else. Like, like I don't even know how or, like, or a sea. I, would, I can't or even imagine like how. Uh, like a yes. like a long if like it was a long a, lake. If it was a lake, I would say like or like a, a sea. I would say it was like it's widest between this city and this city. But yeah, uh, you got it right, yeah, sure. and that's 100%, yeah. 100% on that one. Let's talk their egg clutch size. They lay relatively few eggs compared to their kin, um, with only 240 eggs per clutch. How many of the number of eggs used in a traditional 9-inch two-layer cake go into the number of eggs in a filly row clutch? <laughs> How many eggs are in the clutch again? What was the number? Uh, 240. Here's a hint. 
Eggs give cakes structure and cohesion. You can make a cake without eggs or egg substitutes, but they will be less firm and more crumbly. They also contribute to flavor, moisture, and emulsification. Do you know what emulsification is? Is it like emulsion from yeah, years you know of war? <laughs> yeah. It's like a bubbly, volatile substance. Do, is it a mixture between um, fat and sugar? Because that's what emulsion is. I think in um, in Gears of War, it's a mix of like lava, <laughs> lava, and uh, <laughs> and, um, and meth. Fair enough. Lava and meth. Um, How many cakes worth of eggs? 40. 40, final answer? Yeah. Correct answer is 60. Uh, is that a nursing school? No. There are because around four eggs in a typical cake. Four, I said. Two I to four. Six. You said two two there, layers, so I thought it was going to be like three in each, but. If you want a particularly moist cake, you might go with six. I saw I some people said. I love moist cakes. Those, those two to kinds. six, depending on the type of cake. But four seems to be the, like, the gold standard. Six every time. Eggs are great. Also, uh, moist, yeah. moist cakes are better than dry cakes. <laughs> That's true. Ob objectively. Um, you can't even argue it. <laughs> yeah, dry cake is just cornbread. If you like dry cake, you're uh, objectively and fundamentally incorrect. You're eating you're eating cake incorrectly, and I'm eating cake correctly. <laughs> Maybe they just hate the word moist so much that they have to not eat it. They have to eat the driest cake possible. Like they have to eat a <laughs> cake that if like when they cut it, it just it just turns into crumbs immediately. <laughs> They have to like yeah. That's what they they have to take a straw and like like vacuum it up. They have to. I vacuum up all your cake. They have to. Vacuum they have it to. Up. I. <laughs> they have to do a line of of the cake in order to actually ingest it. Oof. <laughs> that's all I got for that. Do you have any fast facts before we get into the thick fact? The moist thick, fact. Thick fact. Um. Yes, very few. Uh, so, because there's not a lot of information about this animal, uh, it lives in warm waters across the world's oceans. Um, it lives very deep down, uh, and it likes to eat zanclia. Oh, is, same. Mm-hmm. I mean, although probably not. If you're not eating zanclia, you're not living. It does sound like an ingredient you'd read on nutrition's facts. It sounds like a, um, it, it sounds, it sounds like a medication that would have like a mascot. Like <laughs> there's mucinex, there's nasonex, and then there's anklia. But what I'm guessing it probably actually is, is jellyfish. Yes. Plankton? It's a type of hydrozoan that you don't need to talk to your doctor about for eating because you shouldn't eat it. Um, it is, it's like, it's very small. Uh, predatory cnidarians, which it's basically tiny jellyfish. And the way that it eats them is it will take its slug foot and latch it on and consume it. Mm. Because this is a slug, so it's got a foot. It is a gastropod. Is it, a, it, it is a stomach footer. And I will leave it at that because I uh, I do not know how deep your major fact goes, and that is an intended pun. <laughs> oh, the the answer is not very actually, in terms of the pun. Uh, but yeah, I'm calling this major fact fake fish. Hashtag fake fish. Um, Philly row are sea slugs, like it, like we, we we've been talking about that have developed an anatomical form that is very similar to the fish of Actinoptergy. Wow. Interesting. 
Done. Uh, most sea slugs live and move like slugs. <laughs> you wouldn't, wouldn't you believe that? Uh, they crawl along the seafloor and uh, among the coral. If they swim, it might be in a ribbon like, you know, like a ribbon uh, like pattern. Like or the like, Elysium you know. sea slug. Yes. Yeah. But uh, the filaro swims, moves, and even acts similar to a fish. Even though they are, they sport bioluminescence like the deep sea creatures, they don't live in the deep sea. They live in the open ocean close to the surface. So th- at that, at that, uh, living depth and location. Their biggest challenge is the fact that they love the taste of jellyfish and that they float on currents uh, in the open ocean, not on the rocks and crevices of the seafloor. So to hunt in the open ocean, you need to become an adept swimmer. So what can a slug do to get better at swimming? It develops fins. So uh, they locate fish with two long appendages near the front of their faces, which you mentioned in the description, called rhinophores, uh, which are chemoreceptors. They like, like they're detecting, basically sniffing them out. Um, and these chemoreceptors, these rhinophores, come out of the sides of their body, similar to like a fish's fins, although closer to the face than where a fish's. Um, so, uh, I forgot what those are called. The side fins, uh, would be, um, when, uh, when they find a jelly, they start to act more like a slug, like you mentioned by using their foot, uh, like a gastropod does like gastropods use their foot to cling to surfaces like a snail. Um, but, but in most gastropods, the foot is really long and it runs the length of their underside, like their whole Everything you know about him is foot. Like uh, every uh, the part of the snail that's touching the ground is the foot um, that you see is all, all foot. But filaro feet are much smaller since they've devoted a lot of their anatomical real estate to develop a fish-like tail fin. Um, but the small, sticky foot remains uh, near their mouth, allowing them to cling to food and chomp. So not only do they have fins... Uh, they have a general body shape that is extremely fish-like. If you look up a picture of this when you're not driving. Um, and so this is an example of something in nature called a co- convergent evolution, uh, which is when two different species develop traits that are very similar, despite the fact that they don't have any genetic relationship at all. We've talked about this um, among mammals. The best form to take is mouse form so even even animals that aren't like related at all can sometimes look similar to a mouse like certain marsupials in australia and like indonesia looking mouse like even though they they don't have any relationship to to the rodent mouse there are Mm -hmm. a lot of mouse like things and weasel like things yeah so it's just that that is a very efficient and tried and true form to take as an animal. So through generations upon generations of like living the, the animals that don't look that, you know, diverge from a mouse form die. And the ones that conform to mouse form live. So you end up with a lot of mouse shaped things. Uh, and such is the case with this, fish like um gastropod uh so this convergence often happens because animals live in similar conditions and they need similar tools so the best form to take when getting around in the open ocean just might be the form of a fish so even and even humans strap fins to their feet when they go snorkeling we take on fish form when we get in the water or at least form of form. fish. Yeah, form of a fish. So that's all I got on that. Uh, I went through it octo- really quickly, but octopus and squid form also seems to work pretty well. Yeah, like um, jetting water out. Well, definitely squid. Squid are like like extremely numerous in the ocean. 
Yeah, but, but the um, fastest thing are fish. Yeah. So I wanted to, I was, I, so I said that they live pretty far down, but then you said they live pretty close to the surface. And I was trying to figure out like why I, where the discrepancy was and where I came up, where I, I why I put down that they live far down. And that's because I read that they, um, they live between the benthic and, uh, pelagic zone. And the benthic is the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> the pelagic is the so top. they live between the bottom and the top of the ocean um or like they're as like their adaptation over the years has brought them closer to the surface Be because well, they, because they only i wonder if they travel with the uh with the deep the, scattering layer the because that i said <laughs> i was reading something that said they only come out at night and what do you come out of in the open ocean other than the deeper ocean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's true. That's true. Like how do you come out of something when you're just swimming? I bet they, is the, is that, I wonder if they live in the, um, the twilight zone. So when they, they come up with the, uh, deep scattering layer at night, imagine if you will, a slug that looks like a fish. You think it's a fish, <laughs> but it's actually a slug. You might just be in the twilight zone. I love the deep scattering layer. It is the it lives in the twilight zone, and it's a very twilight zone thing. Yeah, it's like, hey, did you know that there's like a gajillion fish that make up uh, a the sea floor for a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, <laughs> our fish will blot out the sea floor. <laughs> then we will, uh, then we'll submarine splash in the shade. above that. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll sonar above it. Yeah. But that's all I got. Yeah. This is another one of those animals that like, you got to look it up. Um, if you're not driving and take a, t take a gander at this gander. Cause it is a crazy looking dude it i mean yeah. there's certain pictures of it that look that make, make it look just like a clear fish with a mustache a, a good one a good mustache um w but it's a slug mm -hmm. it is a slug it is crazy yeah there, there there's not a lot known about it there's uh so i I was talking, I wanted to talk about like their hunting and stuff, which I did anyway, but I knew I had to leave some of that for you because there was just not that much to talk about, <laughs> uh, because we don't know a ton about it, but it's like, it looks like a fish and that's pretty, pretty neat. Um, I went, I remember when I went, uh, I went scuba diving when I was in South Africa and one of the people that was on the tour with me was actually a researcher. That was um, observing and collecting nudie branches, little little slugs, um, in the uh, coral reefs, and so that's how I know that that's my closest interaction with these this um, order of animals. I didn't see any, but they said they saw some. I was I was trying not to die because it was my first time scuba diving. So I was a little bit more concerned with like breathing and nitrogen in my bloodstream, but they were finding all kinds of neat stuff. <laughs> they showed me pictures of stuff that I swam right over in my panic. Hmm. But yeah. So that is the Philly row. Unless you got anything else. Uh, that's all I got. So if you're out there in podcasting, Snack on some Nidarians. Flex your impressive mustache horns. And impersonate a fish. Like the Philly Road here in Life, Death, and Texas.
Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. Life, Death, and Taxonomy is my favorite in the world podcast. <laughs> in the Twilight Zone. T is for Twilight. <laughs> Life, Death, and Twilight Zone. <laughs> I like how my impersonation of the of the narrator from Twilight Zone is just Zap Brannigan. <laughs> <laughs>